Thank you for joining Let's Talk About Health in Africa on the HSS podcast with me, Lenny Aswan. Universal health coverage means that all people have access to healthcare services they need, when they need them, where they need them, and without going through financial hardship. It includes the full range of essential health services, from health promotion to prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care. At the moment, at least half of the people in the world do not receive the healthcare services they need. And every year, about 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty because of out-of-pocket spending on healthcare. The government of South Africa is trying to change this by instituting the National Health Insurance Scheme. Today, I'm in conversation with Dr. Nicholas Crisp, the Deputy Director General of National Health Insurance at the Department of Health in South Africa. I'm the coordinator of the National COVID-19 Vaccination Program. We will be discussing what it means for South Africa and other African countries to transition from the pandemic to the endemic phase of this global emergency crisis. Thank you for joining us on the HSS podcast with me, Lenia Swenda, where we talk to leaders who are transforming healthcare in Africa. Today, I'm in conversation with Dr. Nicholas Chris, the Deputy Director General of National Health Insurance at the Department of Health in South Africa and the coordinator of the National COVID-19 Vaccination Program. We're going to be discussing what it means for South Africa and other African countries to be transitioning from the pandemic to the endemic phase. Dr. Crisp, welcome to Let's Talk About Health in Africa. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Lenny. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Wonderful. Let's start by talking about your role at the National Department of Health in South Africa, where you are currently wearing two hats. What is your mandate at the NHI and as a coordinator of the National COVID-19 Vaccination Program? How different or similar to each other are these two roles? <laughs> yeah, Lenia, so at a personal level, I've been in the health system in South Africa since 1984, but I've also worked in Nigeria for 16 years and I've worked in Ghana and uh, Tanzania, Namibia, all over the place. Uh, during that period, but I've been back in government in South Africa now for just on eight months. And I came back into the, the Department of Health because I'm passionate about the reforms that are required to get a national health insurance in place. But I came back during the COVID epidemic and just after we were um, introducing vaccines into the country. So as one of the senior people, I was asked if I would uh, oversee and support the vaccination program. So that is not my primary task, although I'm very happy to do it. Uh, my primary task is to kickstart and put some machinery in place to start preparing for the national health insurance. Now, that's a really worthy, I think, uh, mission that you have there to, to put in place these reforms to make sure that all South Africans can have access to health care when they need it, near where, near to where they need it and without going into poverty. And I was just looking at the WHO statistics, 100 million people every year who are driven deeper into poverty. So this is a very important agenda for, for many countries across the continent. Now, you mentioned sort of your role as the national coordinator for vaccination, and we've had a ton of problems across the region in terms of accessing vaccines. And, and now that you know, we are well into the pandemic, we have been seeing a lot of vaccines being donated by countries that have been holding excess stocks of vaccines and donating those to the countries of Africa. And now there's been a lot of press about the number of doses of vaccines that are, have been sent to countries on the continent that have expired. What do you make of those criticisms that African countries really aren't able to utilize the vaccines even when they receive it, which seems to justify that it was okay for them not to have any vaccines in the first place. Yeah, well, then yes, I, you know, obviously this vaccine apartheid, as we call it, is highly unacceptable right from the word go, you know, having to compete for vaccines in a market where there was hoarding by those who were able to pay for it was highly unacceptable. And we know that there have been mechanisms put 
in place where our own president has been involved with the African Union process. Uh, our Zimbabwean colleague uh, has been in, involved in trying to get a, a system established. We've been trying to work together with COVAX for those countries in our region that uh, don't have their ability to buy their own services. So, uh, you know, I think that we have uh, tried to put mechanisms in place to procure. Early on in the epidemic, or in the pandemic, it was uh, the, the problem was getting vaccine. Now the problem is using the vaccine. Um, we've had a number of waves. Each of those waves has had its own characteristics. And now we've had a wave that's been uh, very widespread, but relatively mild compared with the other, the other waves. So now people are saying, oh, well, we don't need to vaccinate anymore. And now we get the donations of the vaccines. So this whole thing is back to front. I don't think this is the way you put global health care onto a safe footing. I think what if my, my health is my brother's health, my neighbor's health is my health. And if we don't make sure that, especially in infectious diseases, all of us are protected, it's not helping anybody, neither the rich nor the poor. So I'm extremely critical of what has happened and uh, don't think it has been useful at all in the global scheme of things. Indeed, it is back to front, just the way the whole thing has been managed and, and the, the global mechanisms for making sure that everybody can access vaccines equitably just have not worked. But good to see that we were able to put some mechanisms into place to circumvent those challenges. But what I've been wondering about, Dr. Chris, is whether, you know, just, just given the press around, you know, this, this whole issue of utilization and, you know, versus um hesitancy and so forth should should african countries be really accepting the the vaccines that they are now receiving from their bilateral partners and covax especially given the issues with the shelf lives and so forth yeah so um Linus, we in south africa have um been offered a lot of donations we got one big donation from the u.s government at a time when we couldn't get vaccine the Johnson & Johnson disaster had happened and we had relied on a very large uh, procurement of Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And when it didn't come, our vaccination program actually ran out of vaccine. So we had geared up at a point to a point where we were able to use more vaccine than we could receive. And that was timely and had a reasonable uh, expiry date. And so we were extremely grateful for that. Now we find ourselves in a situation where everybody wants to give us vaccine, even vaccines that we don't use in the country. And they are not happy when we turn it down. So we have turned down no less than five sizable donations of vaccines from other countries, sometimes because we just have enough stock now, and sometimes because these are vaccines that we would have to change our whole program to accommodate them. And I don't think that donors always understand that the logistics of each vaccine is different. So not even just the ad 26 vaccines compared with the mRNA vaccines, but across the board. And in Africa, there are not many places in the continent that can accommodate minus 70 and minus 40 storage conditions to use mRNA vaccines. And then that means they have to use the, uh, the, ad, the adenovirus stem vaccines for, for their programs. And it, you need time to gear up. So you can't have a shelf life of one month or two months uh, to distribute the vaccines, to get the cold chains properly in place, to be responsible about the way you procure the syringes and the needles and to vaccinate people. It's not something you organize over a weekend. So I do think that there are unrealistic expectations placed on countries and we need to put our foot down and only accept what we know we can use with the speed of our vaccination programs. It makes sense that whatever donations come in have to serve the, the, the real needs that are on the ground and can fit into the programs that exist because otherwise it, it becomes quite a task then and perhaps detract from all of the other objectives that, that countries would have in terms of the healthcare. Now, South Africa started um, one of your, your biggest companies, Aspen, uh, Pharmacare started making the vaccine. They went into partnership with the J and J to make the vaccine on on domestic soil. I mean, it's fill and finish, but it's being done on African soil. What does it mean for South Africa to be donating vaccines to to other African countries? I've I've read this in the paper, um, and you know, especially because you haven't yet achieved 
your target vaccination threshold and there's been some challenges around that. Does it mean that you're making uh, a lot of vaccines in excess or you just have excess stocks you're not able to use at the moment because of the challenges around vaccination? Okay, so there are balances in, in what has happened here. So we have vaccinated as of yesterday, just over 30 million vaccinations in South Africa. There are 17 million people who have been vaccinated uh, fully uh, in this period. Uh, and we have now got a situation where the uptake or the demand for the vaccine has decreased, but we had already procured vaccines, both Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer. And we got a, this uh, seven and a half million doses at the time when we were in trouble where there was no Johnson & Johnson vaccine available. But that is a separate issue from the fact that vaccines are filled and finished or manufactured here in South Africa. We are also busy gearing up for two other major vaccine manufacturing plants to be inside South Africa. And uh, there's no reason why, I mean, that is not for our domestic consumption. That is to make sure that we help with all our neighbors and that we get better vaccine security in Africa. We can't continue to be dependent on a couple of vaccination plants and even for other pharmaceutical plants that are in the Western world or in the East and that we do not have the security of those vaccines. So South Africa sees this as a far bigger picture, primarily for the SADC region where our immediate partners, you know, there's a lot of movement of people between us. We have one common health uh, um, uh, sort of set of health needs in this part of the world, but also for the, the broader Africa. If we have the capability, we should put it in place. These are private companies. They are um, going to be selling this vaccine, but obviously from South Africa's perspective, we would want to see that done responsibly. And they work very closely with, uh, with us as governments. And so we are, we are happy with what is going on. We don't buy all of that vaccine. We're glad that it's available into the market of the continent. No, that's great to see the continent working together to really tackle this, this common challenge and, and South Africa really taking a, a bigger perspective in terms of how we go forward as a continent. Now, can we just go and talk about the, the, the NHI bill? some of the issues that has been coming up during this public consultation that is going on at the moment. So there has been some concerns around, you know, the, the proposed national health insurance scheme and how it will be funded. Some in the private sector have been concerned and warning that the proposed bill will introduce a number of threats in, in the health sector, especially with the way that it deals with the, the, the private sector and, and, and medical aid. Now, I was reading an article by, by Discovery who has been arguing that if the medical schemes are eliminated as is proposed by the NHI bill, there will be a 212 billion rand funding shortfall or funding gap that will need to be absorbed by the state. And the only way to fill that gap is by increasing taxation. And if the government chooses to increase the health budget using the tax increases, then this would require that Treasury would have to collect an additional 4% of GDP in taxes. And they are saying that this figure is too high and it's not feasible. What would you say to, to some of these concerns being raised? Yeah, thanks very much, Lenia. So at the moment, let's, let's see what will, what is healthcare cost and what is it going to cost and what can we afford? So we spend as a country, eight and a half percent of our GDP on healthcare. That is a respectable expenditure on healthcare. It's not the 18% that the United States spends, but it's certainly more than the one and a half percent that some uh, of GDP that some African countries spend on healthcare. Now, where does that eight and a half percent come from and what is it spent on? So roughly, and now it's easier just to talk roughly because some of these figures are quite hard to measure, roughly half of that 8.5% is collected in general taxes, goes into the fiscus, and is spent in the public sector through a complicated set of nine provincial governments, one national government, and a host of local governments who are delivering different parts of the, the services with that money. That amounts to roughly 250 billion rand, just to round off so the easy figures to follow. The other half of the 8.5% of GDP is spent, is raised in the private sector as voluntary expenditure and is spent largely in the private sector. 
So it's, it is raised, about 180 to 190 billion of that money is raised through voluntary contributions to medical schemes. But there are more than 74 medical schemes and each of them has several packages. So we're looking at over 300 different options. And that money is spent on roughly 15, 16, maybe 17% of the population. And then there's another uh, portion, 70, 60, 70 billion rand, which people spend out of pocket, either because they chose a package that did not cover their care, their care, or they chose not to insure themselves, or they were going to need to use the public service, and then they went and sold their house or their car and raised money to go into the private sector because they didn't want to go to the public sector when the need arose. So it's messy. There are lots of different competing demands. But what has happened is the provision of healthcare as a result of this distortion in where the money is, is heavily in the private sector. So private providers, 67% of all specialists and up to 90% in some specialties are in the private sector. And that means that although South Africa theoretically uh, all people who live in this country, even non-citizens, have access to health care. So when the, you'll hear them argue there is universal health coverage, it's nonsense. It's universal health coverage that's not universal. Uni means one. We work together, we are one. There's no one health anything in this country. There's some for you, there's some for me, and I get more and you get less. And it's based on historical demand, not on the need. So we need to shift it. So the discovery is quite correct. You will need to take the 4.5% that is currently government spending and increase it to somewhere around 8% of, uh, of the GDP that is raised through taxes. So one way to do it is to introduce a payroll tax to those who are currently paying a voluntary contribution to medical schemes. That's one way. And another way to do it is to change the tax structure. So to increase that, which I wouldn't like at all because there's no guarantee it would come to health in the first place and it taxes poor people indiscriminately more than it taxes rich people. And uh, the other way to do it is through the other structured taxes that we have at the moment, either in companies or personal tax. Either which way, we're going to spend eight, somewhere around 8% of GDP on healthcare, but we will eliminate somewhere around 12%, which is spent on the complicated administration, both by having nine different administrations and parliaments and so forth, deliberating over healthcare in the public sector, but all the trustees and the boards and the administrators and the overheads and the payments of brokers to try and tell us what we, they think we're going to need in the future. A lot of that will not be needed and we can redirect our energy and those resources into healthcare instead of administrative overheads. So it is complicated. It can't happen overnight, but there's enough money being spent on healthcare. It's how we slowly but surely and systematically and deliberately realign it so that we all get better healthcare. Yes. 8% is still significantly less than the 15% that African member states committed to in, in the Abuja declaration. And, and indeed, there is a need to, to restructure healthcare to make sure that everybody is covered in a, in a way that, that, that makes sense. And, and obviously, that is not a very easy thing to do for, for a large country like this. Now, what about the, the proposal for using the blended finance model where you're not necessarily relying uh, uh, predominantly on the fiscus to, to cover that increase that is needed, you know, a, a model is a little bit similar to those used in the Netherlands and Indonesia. Would this allow South Africans to, you know, feel more at ease, especially those who are objecting to um, the pot possible route of just using taxation as a way of filling the funding gap? Yeah, Linnea, so there are lots of ways to fudge the issues here. And this is one way to do it. You know, we're going to blend the finances, we're going to do that. So the National Health Insurance Bill does not ban medical schemes. It just says medical schemes can't cover what the National Health Insurance covers. So the question is, what will the National Health Insurance cover? And in the beginning, it will cover less, and over time, it will cover more. So systematically, the need for self-insurance disappears. So people who sit on the margins of the medical schemes, which is in fact the majority of people who don't have comprehensive cover and who are just using you know, small products or uh, hospital plans, 
will find that they've, all their health care is covered by the package offered by the national health insurance. So what we need to do is wait until we are clear what it is that the benefits are going to be that are provided. There are some very obvious benefits that will not be provided. So things that do not add to the health of the nation will be excluded. So, um, you know, uh, aesthetic surgery, plastic surgery that is not for a medical reason, but is for a, <clears throat> a personal choice reason, would not be included because that's not adding to the health of the, of the nation. And then there's the question of, uh, you know, when, when is dental health care an improvement in your oral health, which is, a, you know, improvement to your, your body? And when is dental health just a, um, you know, an improvement of your aesthetics? So some of those procedures that do not add health will obviously be excluded. But then there are, like we currently have, exclusions that are due to um, rationing of services. So for instance, you can just about do anything until you're 90 years old, you can do a liver transplant and a heart transplant. But what value does it add? So some very wealthy people would still expect to have dialysis at the age of 85 and still expect to get a liver transplant at the age of 85. That would not be covered by the national health insurance. I think I could say that pretty categorically. Right now in the public service, we have cutoffs at, uh, at uh, age and at uh, renal function and at a lifestyle where we do not uh, dialyze and we do not do offer uh, liver transplants to people because there's no prospect of a, of a full life after that. Those decisions are difficult to make. Clinicians are forced to make them from time to time. And it's about, so sometimes it's personal rationing, but at a national level, and even medical schemes now do that as well. They don't offer certain drugs. So it's incumbent on us to set what are the benefits we're going to cover? What is the health technology through HTA, health technology assessment, that is the most cost effective? How do we reduce the administrative overheads? And how do we raise the necessary, um, get the, the, the referrals right so that we enter our healthcare at the lowest possible level, the cheapest possible level, and don't start with a pediatrician or an obstetrician. You start with a general practitioner or a community nurse, and you get referred as and when there's a need. So you've got to reduce the cost of care and not think that everybody's going to enter right at the top and be able to pay for everything. So that's what the NHI can do by not having blended financing, but by having strong purchasing power and being able to do strategic purchasing for where the need is, as opposed to where the demand is being generated by either providers or people who read too much on Dr. Google. Yes, I suppose, yes. I mean, it, it makes sense to take a public health perspective. You know, how much does this add to, to the public health of the nation? And indeed, these questions are questions that a lot of countries are dealing with with respect to what do you cover what is it, what makes sense to cover in in the you know under the national health scheme we see a lot of these conversations happening all over in 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 Europe for example when it comes to cancer treatment you know where is the cutoff point when it makes sense for uh, the the you know national health to to be covering people so but this is obviously a work in progress now do you think it's unreasonable for people to be expecting and calling for the bill to provide certainty on a number of issues in terms of the nature and scope of the healthcare services that will be available in and outside the NHI, NIH and you know how registered users will you know be able to access health services is it too much to ask for at this point considering that this will have to be a work in progress which has to unravel and issues dealt with as it progresses. Yeah, Linus, it's way too much. So it, was, it would be a, um, a, a, a foolhardy, I would say. It would be unreasonable and foolhardy to put too much into a piece of legislation because once a law is a law, you have to comply with that law and you don't create flexibility. So all of our law in South Africa is enabling legislation. It's the style of what we do. So what you do in the law is you create the framework. And no one law ever operates on its own. We work within um, probably 100 pieces of legislation in health. Termination of pregnancy, registration of medicines, uh, medicines research, regulation of pharmaceutical. These are all in different pieces of legislation. 
So we have core pieces of legislation that describe how our system works. And this one will describe how we pay for how that system works. And it will make amendments to other pieces of legislation. So the core, this will become the predominant and the, the main uh, act for healthcare and all other health legislation will be subordinate to it. So what we have is an in, insurance uh, uh, act that will be in place that describes the overarching and enabling environment of how health services are procured from whom and under what conditions. Then we have the Health Act. And the Health Act will be amended by the National Health Insurance Act to take away some of the functions from the provinces as primary assigned functions and delegate them back to them so that the money can be removed from the provincial equitable shares and put into the national pot. It will also create some structures which have a national authority for the design and delivery of the district health system and specifically the primary healthcare services within the district health system. So it, there will be amendments to that piece of legislation. It also puts in some amendments to the uh, Medical Schemes Act, which makes it possible for the national uh, fund to um, capture information from uh, members of medical schemes. So there will still be medical schemes. And over time, the structure of those medical schemes and amendments to that act are probably going to happen further. But there are other pieces of legislation that we const continue to have to uh, respond to. For instance, in our digital systems, although the National Health Act has a section that says the National Department prescribes all digital systems for all healthcare, which by the way includes the private sector. There are also pieces of legislation in post and telecommunications that we must comply with. There is our Poppy Act about personal information and how we manage personal information. So people who read one bill on its own and think it must be full of everything with no regulations and everything must be written in there, are just asking for trouble and are not understanding how the law works. This is an enabling piece of legislation. It must prescribe the frame. And if there are issues around clauses or details of governance, that's fine. Those should be discussed. And if they need to be amended, that's also fine. We can listen to how they should be amended. But to throw it all out and try and get all the detail in is not reasonable. That's, that's very clear that the legislation will have to be read within the context with reference to other existing pieces of legislation that are governing health and it, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, presumably, uh, where there is nothing and this is the one that uh, everybody must refer to. So, so that makes sense, but I suppose always when there's something new there are many fears you know of what it means the people who stand to lose things and 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 those who start to gain things and i suppose it's a conversation to arrive at a place where everybody is comfortable this is the end of the first part of my conversation with dr nicholas Priest, the deputy director general of national health insurance at the department of health in south africa the second part will be coming up next Join us as we continue our conversation with Dr. Nicholas Chris, the Deputy Director General of National Health Insurance at the Department of Health in South Africa. Now, let's just go into then the, the, the pandemic, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and how we are looking at it, you know, in African countries, how we're looking at it in South Africa. So there's been a lot of talk by countries or, or countries moving from the pandemic phase to the endemic phase uh, for, for this COVID-19 uh, global crisis that we are living through right now. And, um, and the WHO has been cautioning that, that it's too soon to start talking about these transi transitions and so many things could still happen. We are not there yet. What does it mean, you know, for you, you are running, you know, you're coordinating the national uh, vaccine vaccination program in South Africa. What does it mean for you, this whole conversation about the transition from pandemic to endemic phase? 
Yeah, Linnaeus, thanks. I think that uh, people who are quoted in the in the media space and demanding that we move from one to the other perhaps should go and read the definitions and do a little bit of public health medicine. So a pandemic really is a word that describes the fact that some infection, usually an infectious disease, is in all regions or most regions of the world. That's where it is. That's where we are today. It started off extremely aggressive as something new, and now it's different in different parts. But pretty much all countries in the world, even those who've tried to lock down their little islands, have got COVID. So it is a pandemic. We are dealing with a pandemic. People move very readily through regions of the world, and it continues to spread. We spread it as humans. The virus doesn't spread on its own. We spread it. So it is pan, global, wide, demic in, uh, um, infection. So we are, whether we like it or not, still in a pandemic. But it will settle down so that in parts of the world it becomes controllable and that it, it may even disappear in some parts of the world and go subside to something that you don't even see annually. At that stage, we are dealing with endemic disease. So right now, measles is endemic in South Africa. We don't see a lot of measles. It's in fact, I know colleagues who have qualified years after me have never seen measles. I used to have a whole ward of children with measles when I was a young doctor. And in fact, when there were refugees coming across from the border from Mozambique during the war, we saw thousands of adults even dying from measles. Now, that was a serious, serious epidemic, localized epidemic. So epidemic is when pandemic gets out of, I mean, when endemic gets out of control, we deal with a flare up. And if it's big enough, it becomes an epidemic. And then it, uh, get, we get control of it through vaccination or it burns itself out or whatever other mechanisms, depending on what we are dealing with at the time. So I think people need to understand we are dealing with all three at the moment. It is a pandemic. It's settling down that we can treat it endemically, and it will flare up from time to time. And God help us, I hope we don't get severe variants and we are able to see those flare ups in a manageable epidemics from time to time and squash them quickly as our vaccine coverage and our vaccines become more targeted. Because I'm sure there will be second generation vaccines pretty soon. So the question for us now in the services is how do we move from mass vaccination campaigns that consume our resources and distract us from HIV, TB, chronic diseases, and so forth, into a situation where we release our staff to go back to those looking after those conditions in an integrated way, because that's another problem. We've just created silos, and this is a new silo. And how do we move the vaccination of COVID vaccines into our routine services? And there are ways to do it in the childhood vaccination program, in the adolescent vaccination program, which largely happens at schools, and in adult vaccination programs, which we do in congregate settings for old people, uh, for like the flu vaccines and so forth. And to make sure that until we have wide coverage of these vaccines, and I'm talking really wide coverage, not just what we have now, how do we have, make sure the vaccine's available in all hospitals and all clinics and all pharmacies and all general practitioners' rooms. Then we can't be distributing trays of 1,000 vials at a time. We need to be sending out a couple of vials at a time so that they are everywhere and they're accessible on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, that's difficult when you're at minus 40 and minus 70 degrees. It's a lot easier when you're at fridge temperature. So we're going to need different vaccines that are easier to work with, and we're going to need to think more smartly about how we manage our cold chains. And that's the tradition transition that we are talking about at the moment. Absolutely. And, and of course, you know, the fact that every single health system has been focused, laser focused on the pandemic, understandably so, but at the expense of a lot of things. And, and in African countries, we have had the other challenge of what, the, what those service disruptions have meant for our HIV programs, for malaria, for TB, for childhood vaccinations, and the reversal in gains in healthcare that has happened as a result of that. So it's, it, it's a massive challenge to think how we move 
from from this phase of being so focused on a single um, outbreak, an important outbreak, of course, because it has taken cost so many lives. But how do we make sure that all of the other needs that still exist, that continue to exist, uh, continue to be made? But in terms of health systems, when we finally get there, we are not there yet. That transition from pandemic to endemic is still far off. What would be the implications when we finally do get there for the health systems in, in South Africa, in other African countries in terms of managing and catching up on all of these other areas where we have significantly fallen behind as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, um, Linnaeus, this is not the first time and it won't be the last time that we run into these challenges. So uh, I worked in West Africa where uh, the whole health system of several countries comes to us, came in 2000, or came to a standstill every month where everybody got their per diems and went to the field for polio eradication campaign. Then they had subnational polio eradication campaign. So nobody was paying attention to measles or tuberculosis or any of the other diseases. And the antenatal care services were really nothing to be proud of at all because everything was being directed to polio. So we've had that. We've had the same way uh, in our country with HIV and AIDS. At one stage, the HIV and AIDS budget in South Africa's health system was bigger than the whole rest of the health budget. It's almost half even now. It's massive. We have had TB for years and years and years. Why don't we have that kind of emphasis on TB? We have other diseases. West Africa and other parts of Africa in Central Africa have also had Ebola. You suddenly have to challenge your, channel your money. We've had outbreaks here where the weather changes and you get malaria. And suddenly, everything stops, and you rush to try and control the malaria for the season. So I think the, the thing about epidemic and pandemic preparedness is, do we know how to respond without collapsing the rest of the system? Can we mobilize additional resources and not take someone who's trying to run the national health insurance, someone who's trying to run the hospitals and the nursing colleges, someone who's trying to run the other childhood vaccination programs, take them all out of their jobs and put them into one. How do we do that without distracting ourselves from those services? And I think that's what this uh, WHO um, initiative has been about and the WHA resolution recently has been, are we prepared? Do we know how to avoid getting ourselves into this uh, quandary every time there's a new disease? And I think at, uh, for now, we, the answer is no, we don't know how to do that. We, we don't know how to redirect resources. There isn't a pool of money somewhere that we can go as a contingency fund and pull it in. So for us now, we are already shifting our um, focus, our energy in our public health system back into the other diseases, the other, the other public health programs and uh, catching up on uh, surgery, with, which has got behind and doing as much as we possibly can. But the, the, the risk is that we do it too soon uh, with too many resources and we are unable to sustain the additional resources that we brought into the service, both professional and supporting services, to run a proper, proper vaccination program. And that's the balance. I'm pretty sure that in parts of the country we'll get it right and in other parts we'll get it wrong. Um, and we just need to be not so proud that we are willing to adapt and, and very quickly uh, change direction if we have to. My view is that there will be a fifth wave and that fifth wave will be the telling wave of whether we are finally getting on top of um, variance and variance control or whether we're gonna have to sit it out a bit longer. So I'm personally a bit nervous of moving too fast, um, but maybe that's just, I've been in the health services for 35 years and I've learned to be cautious. Well, I'm sure you're looking at, at this with a sober eye of experience and you have seen how this plays out. So that's certainly something of value for, for us, uh, for, for those of us living in South Africa and, and, and uh, across the continent as well. But now 
pandemics and these nature of emergency, like you say, are a fact of life. They will happen and they do happen. And what we are struggling with right now is the fact that we don't know how to respond whilst keeping all the other threads, all the other balls, keeping them in the air. And this is not a challenge only of African countries. We've seen this play out all over the world, how systems were obviously collapsing from the excessive burden of disease as a result of the pandemic. But the difficulty of maintaining other services so that you minimize the, the, the collateral damage that occurs as a result of this. In your view, what would be the key element? Best case scenario, how would we have to do it? What would it take? for a health system to be able to, to be prepared enough to deal with an outbreak, but still keeping everything else catered for. How would that look like? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a tall order, and I think we've had some insights into that now during this epidemic. First of all, health is not in isolation, and you cannot uh, change your entire country just because of a, a health issue. Um, but health or lack of health has an impact on the fabric of society and the economy, and there's no getting away from it. So we, we need to see what happens and what we do in the context of the rest of economy. So all the other government departments and their functions. Look at the impact on schools, look at the impact on uh, people's livelihoods, on our social, you know, the numbers of suicides and people who have got mental uh, stress as a result is not just health workers, society in general, because we are social beings, our ability to generate income and look after our family. So we have to see whatever we do in that context. So when we respond, we must respond collectively. And that's one of the frustrations I've experienced at times during this pandemic is that um, health is required to take the lead, and therefore it will be the health's budget that pays for everything. But the messaging that had to go out to the public can't just come from the health budget. It must come from education. It must come from social development. It must come from the defense force and the police. Everybody must be contributing to whatever the messaging is and the budget associated with that. It's much better now, and certainly the private sector has and when I say the private sector, I'm not talking about private health sector. The private sector, the economy, has really come to the party. All the various media outlets, private companies are sponsoring adverts, getting involved. That's the kind of response you need if you deal with something that's of a, a national interest like this. The second big area, so working together, the second big area is data. The more you know, the quicker you can take decisions. The more data that's in one place that can be analyzed quickly, the easier it is to target your responses. So we have uh, had a very difficult start where there were people pulling in all kinds of directions, both within the public sector, everybody trying to be more important than the next one and having used their, their resources in a particular way. But if you don't have national leadership where there's one common place where we all put our data and where it's uh, analyzed and used and made available to people to take decisions, uh, you just get further and further behind. I think we've had some successes, certainly the EVDS being a national uh, database and it now being linked to the hospital database, the DATCOV, and to deaths all in one platform is a massive, massive advantage. So my advice to countries and our, our advice to ourselves is build your digital capability that it can be interoperable so people each do their own bit, but put the definitions, the, the core elements of that data system, the data exchange mechanisms, the anal analysis of that data, get it all into one space as fast as possible. And for Africa, it's going to be easier than for other countries because there are fewer legacy systems. And there's a lot of digital leapfrogging that is possible because we don't have to pull out some of the old stuff from the past and uh, we can move very quickly to new technologies. That goes together with um, uh, connectivity, which is a big glow. It's a national issue. It's not a health issue. It's a national issue. And then the last one is, uh, well, the third one, which would say the third big one, is that uh, we need to develop our capabilities for 
the science behind whatever we're dealing with. And we've done some things really well in South Africa. I think we are very proud of the way our diagnostics and our laboratories have worked together. We are proud that we've been able to gear up some of our, you know, the, what you were referring to, the fill and finish in our pharmaceuticals environment. But it's not enough. We really need more. And I think the effort we're putting in now to make sure that we are a player in the space going forward in the science uh, industry and technology of health products uh, should not be underestimated. We need to build that capability in Africa as fast as possible. But those are really important points. Investing in data and digitization of health data and investing in science, creating the right environment for clinical research, for development of products, R&D of products, having the appropriate clinical research environment and, and then commercializing those products, bringing them to market. And of course, the additional piece to that, that we have been talking about a lot on let's talk about health in Africa is what happens then when enterprises bring products to the market? Do we have the right legislative environment that is permissive to those enterprises thriving because they have access to market? And particularly in the health sector, this has been a big challenge before. So a big need there to recalibrate the way our markets are structured in order to make sure that those enterprises can thrive and really go on to serve the needs of the continent. Now, data perhaps is one of the most undervalued and maybe overlooked areas, data assets of countries, they, they have enormous value worth billions of dollars. Do you see in South Africa that there is an appreciation of the value of building a national data assets that can feed all of these activities that you might want to think about in the health sector, for example, from R&D to, to clinical research to, to commercialization of products and their use within the health system? Yeah, Lenia, so everybody understands the value of data and they fight for it um, and hang on to it and don't want to share it and um, do their own thing, their own definitions for their own reasons. Um, and sometimes that's justifiable, I guess, in the private space where you're competing in a, in a true market economy. Uh, there are elements of what you do that you want to keep secret, if not, conf you know, if not confidential, then secret. Um, but in the public space, we need to get this, uh, all the core data that is needed for managing and monitoring the health system. Um, and it needs to be accessible, not the personal files and the patient information data. And we have, uh, you know, quite a lot of fear around people um, using personal data for nefarious reasons or for you know, for marketing that drives us all crazy and so on. So that obviously has to be protected. But the collated and depersonalized data, we need to be able to use it. So I think there is, we certainly have an appreciation for it. And uh, the, everything that's been built for COVID during this period is built on the backbone of the National Health Insurance's data systems. So fortunately, there's been some foresight. And there was four or five years of quite significant investment, both in hardware and software in um, putting a data system in place. Those who were skeptical prior to COVID, I think have seen that if we hadn't had these, this data capability, we would have been in serious trouble. And those who resisted its integration or wanted to do it and do their bit and the private sector will do their own and we'll do our own and so on, have uh, definitely come to the party. And we've seen the value of doing it like this. Of course, it, it will remain tense because of the value of that data. And um, everybody wants to display it in a way that they can brand with their logos and so forth. That's fine. You know, they can, they can do that uh, because there will be niche elements of the data necessary. But do we recognize the value? I think more and more we do. Uh, do we have it all integrated into a way that we need it? No, we don't. Do we have a framework to ensure that it's interoperable? Yes, we do, but it's, it still has to be published so that it's uh, obligatory. But what's the incentive to stick to that interoperable framework? That will only come when the National Health Insurance says, I won't pay you unless you are connected to the system. 
unless you use the data definitions in order to uh, collect what you're doing, unless we have access to the core set of data we need for planning and analysis and uh, making decisions, and unless you are on the digital system for payment, doesn't matter what you do, we will define the benefits we can't pay you because you're not on the system. So I think uh, there will be incentives for people to, um, to play ball and for everybody to be integrated. Then we need the big data capability for using that data responsibly. And what about then the, you know, we, we talked about service disruptions as a result of health emergencies and the impact that has on the, on the uh, national health system. And of obviously providing services digitally is one way to circumvent that particular challenge. Now, we've had conversations about whether, you know, we, there's a need for more plug and play infrastructure that creates the foundation that then allows service providers to come and plug into which, you know, cost effectively to provide services, whether it's telemedicine and, and so forth. What have you seen in South Africa? What is the state of digital service provision? Is that something that you're seeing a lot of progress as a result of what has happened with the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I, we have yes and no. <laughs> so what's happened is that at one stage we got up to 20 service providers in a week uh, lobbying us from the presidency. They start with the president, they write to the president and say we've solved your problems, we've got this whole digital connectivity solution, we can come and put it in next week. Um, we know that it costs hundreds of millions of rand to put these things in and sustain them. So, um, you know, there's any number of um, potential systems, but if you don't have the architecture right and you don't build it so that it's sustainable, um, it's just a waste of money. So what we want to avoid is having everybody doing their own thing and putting in systems that are not interoperable and don't build towards the common architecture. Um, in terms of patient care, um, there are apps, plenty apps that are able to do uh, some patient care, but it's like going to Google to look up your heart attack that you had on Friday afternoon, on Monday morning to say, oh, I should have gone for enzymes. And you become so clever, you come and tell your doctor how to care for you. So, you know, in the hands of the right people, this technology is useful. In the hands of the wrong people who don't have training, it can be devastating. So I think that what we need to concentrate on is the useful applications, um, making tools available to healthcare workers to make decisions based on real training on clinical guidelines, on how to access and, and, uh, and to use those tools, on um, you know, laboratory tests, you can test anything you want, but how do you interpret it if you don't know what you're doing? And we've seen suicides from people who've misinterpreted pregnancy tests. I mean, that's just, just devastating when that happens. So we, we need to be cautious about how we do these things, but we definitely need to incorporate technologies as they come. Um, Telemedicine and mHealth are definitely the way to go, but only when you've got bandwidth and connectivity. I mean, we would never have contemplated this conversation. A few years ago, I would have had to come into, the, even before COVID, I would have had to come into the studio for this discussion. You know, there was Skype and it was the big thing. Now you can chat to your kids every day on WhatsApp on your cell phone and you can have this kind of conference with seven or 800 people participating. So I do think this means we can train people faster. We've done that during COVID. We can consult uh, colleagues in peer reviews and, and senior colleagues in, you know, do I need to refer this patient? This is what I'm seeing. And you can have the actual patients standing in the room with you asking questions and getting credibility that, wow, I don't need to go to the hospital to see a doctor because there's, there's the doctor standing there and I can see that the nurse is consulting. So I think it does change the way we need other infrastructure. But without connectivity, it's all just a pipe dream. So it will remain for the few who have, and it won't be for the few who don't have. So for us, 40% of our public health facilities have either no connectivity or poor connectivity with only push technology available. And we need to work together with the authorities who manage that if we want to play in this space. Certainly, there will be a need to, to coordinate how this is 
done on a national level, having the appropriate guidelines and 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 protections, you know, legal protections as well for for patients and making sure that they have the appropriate guidance to use, you know, those those services in a way that is uh, healthy and that does not create threats to the patient. Now, to conclude, maybe we could just go back to the issue of vaccines and do a bit of stargazing what might happen in the future from this point on. You mentioned that you anticipate a fifth world. How bad could things get for African countries if people are not vaccinated, fully vaccinated, if we don't reach those threshold in the next year or two? Well, for those who have had all four waves in large numbers and have uh, high immunity within their populations, both from vaccination and from wild, uh, wild, wild virus exposure, the fifth wave will only be devastating if it is markedly different and more virulent. Otherwise, it will roll over us like flu. It will be a, a winter of, um, irritation and we will see deaths, but mostly people will be fine and they'll, they'll get over it. If it's a different variant that is a very aggressive, that's a whole nother ballgame. But for those parts of the world where there's not good immunity in the community because there haven't been vaccines available, there have not been widespread infections, and uh, there's not enough immunity in the community, we could get even the alpha back. There could still be beta, delta, delta and Omicron lurking around that spreads in those communities, and they are going to find themselves in trouble with mixed uh, uh, variants uh, being um, uh, in play and uh, un unvaccinated and unimmune populations. And that would be devastating for the economy of Africa. So we definitely need to get uh, under-vaccinated populations vaccinated as quickly as we can. So we've had those countries that bought billions uh, worth of excess doses that they were holding, some of which have been expiring, hence the frantic donations that we have been seeing that has created their own challenges. What do you think, you know, we are likely to see going forward from the perspective of the countries that have bought excess vaccines from the, from the first generation and the fact that we might have second generation vaccines that will be required and that will be coming onto the markets. I mean, how do you see all of this playing out in terms of you know, uh, how countries are thinking about vaccination and uh, get you know, what they already have? Yeah, so uh, let's start off by saying the vaccines work. Uh, there's no question in my mind. There's a whole sex, a sector of society who's skeptical and doesn't believe the vaccines work or believes that they are going to kill us all in five years' time and so on. Uh, that's a lot of nonsense, and we should debunk those myths everywhere we can. So these vaccines do work. They intended to protect the health system, to keep people from getting desperately ill and from dying. Um, but if there's some breakthrough and we get mild illness, well... We do that with the flu vaccines as well, and that's not the end of the world. So the, this generation of vaccines uh, has done what they were supposed to do, but they're not everywhere. So there are still large parts of the world where the populations are not protected, and we need to get vaccines to those people. And I think it's irresponsible to give people vaccine that expires in a month or two's time, especially if you're not also actually physically going and putting the mechanisms to distribute, and administer those vaccines for, uh, for the countries you're donating to. So just donating a vaccine is not helpful. You need to donate everything that goes with making sure that vaccine can be used. Um, so that's what I would encourage for that. But the second generation of vaccines are coming. They will be scientifically different. We are learning a lot more about this particular virus, but we're also learning more about the carrier of the antigen that we are using in the vaccine. And that technology has evolved fast. We've been working on it for years and years for HIV in this country. And that's, I guess, how the mRNA vaccines got up and running so fast. Uh, the next generation is even going to be smarter than this, because we now understand the role of the spike proteins. We understand the nature of the core and the external uh, shell of, uh, of the viruses and so on. So I think things are going to be done very differently in the next 12 months. Um, I look forward to seeing how that e evolves. But until then, my only message would be for those who haven't been vaccinated, 
what have you got to lose? You go out and get vaccinated so that you have a measure of protection and don't wait until you get sick to get your, uh, your immune response. You heard the man, vaccines work, get vaccinated, you have nothing to lose. Dr. Chris, thank you so much for coming onto the HSS podcast. Thank you, Lenes. That was Dr. Nicholas Chris, the Deputy Director General of National Health Insurance at the Department of Health in South Africa. Please subscribe to our channel, like and share our podcast and send us your comments and feedback. Thank you for watching.